DC speculation. It's a slippery slope right now. We're going to take a look at 10 books to possibly speculate on from DC Comics on this video from Bronzeville Comics. Hey there, comic book community. This is Jim from Bronzeville Comics coming to you with another video. Um, we remind you, if you enjoying the content on this channel, please consider subscribing, hit the like button, leave a comment. Let me know what you think about the books that we're talking about here today. Um, in addition, follow us on other socials, Instagram, Bronzeville underscore comics, the same on whatnot. I do whatnot sales every Monday night at 10 PM. And, um, also uh, you can check out my eBay store. You can see that in the link below. Well, I'm, um, a DC fan. I'm a DC fan in a Marvel world. And recently, we've had news uh, about a number of DC projects. So we're going we're gonna to do here, and this is, do your own research if you're looking into, um, if you're looking into buying comic books for investment purposes. Um, I'm just looking at books that I'm considering and I'm buying. I'm going to take a look at 10 DC books that I think do have speculative potential going forward with what we know about the DC movie and TV properties. Um, we're going to take a look at two books from each of five different decades, from the 1960s through the 2000s. So we do have a little bit of a variety. Now, it has been tricky to keep on top of what's happening with DC Comics. Since the merger with Discovery and new uh, people in charge of making decisions... There have been decisions that have been made. Already, we've seen a lot of shakeup on the CW side with the rumors that that entire channel may be sold off. A lot of shows over the last decade have found their home on the CW, the shows that have been produced by Greg Berlanti, the Arrowverse. Already, we've seen DC's Legends of Tomorrow and Batwoman canceled and the future of Flash is uncertain as it's entering its ninth season and it's uncertain as to how long it's going to go on. Jesse L. Martin, who's been a cast member since season one, is left. And both shows, um, both Flash and Legends of Tomorrow, have departed from their comic book roots. As a matter of fact, Legends of Tomorrow basically has almost no characters left that are DC comic book characters. So it's not really a um, franchise that is being helped by or helping the comic book sales. Uh, the White Canary character is eh, kind of tangentially related to um, DC Comics characters. Nick Zanos left. He portrayed Steel, who was a comic book character, a very minor one at that. Uh, Matt Ryan is no longer doing Constantine. That is looks like it's going to be rebooted. And most of the other characters are unique to the show. So it's DC and really name only. Batwoman, I do think that by canceling the CW show. Now, remember, this wasn't the original comic book Kate Kane Batwoman who was in the show uh, right now. It was Ryan Wilder, a different character. Kate Kane is Batwoman in the comics, and you go back to the 1950s when she was introduced as kind of the love interest for Bruce Wayne to squelch the um, homosexual rumors that were portrayed by the those who looked to ban comics, that there was something unnatural in the relationship between Batman and Robin, so they threw in Batwoman as a, um, a romantic interest for Batman. Anyway... Uh, Ruby Rose left the show after the first season and then they were forced to find another character to take up the Batwoman mantle. I think by taking this property off of the CW, it does give DC the opportunity to uh, pursue Batwoman in the Matt Reeves universe. The Batman movie that just came out is already going to have a sequel. They're doing a Penguin TV series and... Um, a Gotham City Police Department series, or is it an Arkham Asylum series? Anyway, there are going to be other series on HBO Max related to 
the Matt Reeves directed Batman movie and uh, it's going to be different than the tone that we see on the CW. So I think that Batwoman is a property that could be used there. In addition, um, we only have, that means there are only a few shows. There were some shows in development. Naomi's still on the CW, Stargirl, and um, Superman and Lois. Those seem to be the two most successful. And I think both of those shows have the potential to be moved over to HBO Max. If you remember, Stargirl premiered on the DC Universe platform, which seemed at the time to be uh, very too much of a niche streaming service. And that proved to be true as all those properties were incorporated into HBO Max. Titans, Doom Patrol, Swamp Thing was canceled. You have the Harley Quinn animated series. And now we've had Peacemaker on HBO Max. Now, much like the CW shows, with the exception of Peacemaker and to maybe a lesser degree Harley Quinn, those shows did not move the needle in the back issue market the way that the Disney plus Marvel Cinematic Universe shows have. And a large part of that reason is that there's no interconnectedness. When we see uh, a character on a TV show, we know that there's a possibility we're going to see them again on another show or in the movies. So that character has life outside of the single property that they're already in. For instance, Flash TV show uh, made use of Elongated Man until the actor who portrayed him came under fire for um, some uh, misconduct either in his Twitter handle, his personal life, whatever it was. I don't remember the details. Anyway, he was out and Elongated Man was out and there's no um, connection with Elongated Man in any other property. One of the interesting things about the Arrowverse shows is they kind of built up to this climax of Crisis on Infinite Earths, which was this huge, ambitious crossover, which included characters from all previous um, iterations of DC movies and TV, from Tom Welling to Burt Ward to Robert Wall to Kevin Conroy. And... What happened is right after that, where they had assembled this Justice League team and in the Hall of Justice, and then COVID stalled production on many of the shows, and it seems as though the Arrowverse is just kind of petering out at this point. I'm not sure what's left of that um, being interconnected. Supergirl was canceled. Black Lightning ran its course. Arrow ran its course. And some of the shows that were potentially coming out of that haven't materialized. And I don't think that they will. I do think that the Warner Brothers Discovery wants to go much more in the vein and kind of ride in the draft of Marvel in seeing what was successful. Maybe doing their own twist and having kind of a separate Batman universe, having more mature, isolated films like The Joker. But I think they'd like to build an extended universe or an extended multiverse with characters that we would see in both movies and TV. On top of that, there are a couple of actors that are already in projects that are going to be released that are um, really ruining their reputations. Amber Heard, the ongoing trial with her ex, Johnny Depp, she is not looking good. A lot of people calling for her removal as Mira in the Aquaman films, and we will touch on that in just a little bit. And, of course, the problems that Ezra Miller, who's starring as Barry Allen, The Flash, is having, um, and how that might affect the release of that movie. Well, so let's take a look at some keys, and we're going to start with the 2000s. Let's work our way backwards. We'll go chronologically backwards. And the first um, comic on my list is a comic that I've been picking up, Justice Society of America, number one, from 2007. The significance of this is that it's the first appearance of Maxine Hunkel Cyclone, who's going to be one of the members of the Justice Society in the Black Adam film. Now, the character in the comic books is the granddaughter of the original Red Tornado, who was a comedic character who appeared on one page in All-Star Comics number three, and then forevermore was a member of the Justice Society of America. She was in the Scribblian Pals strip in All-American Comics, which was a humor strip. Um, and But as time went by and writers 
kind of rediscover the character. She did become a part of the Justice Society, remained part of it. And finally, her granddaughter has powers. Now, there's this is her first appearance. It's also the first appearance of several other uh, pretty much third generation characters for the Justice Society of America. And it's got this Alex Ross cover. Now, this book, uh, a recent 9.8 sold for just $125. It's a book that you can get pretty inexpensively raw. Um, you might be able to find it for like $5 at a show. The other book that I've been grabbing is Justice Society of America number three, which has this Alex Ross cover of Cyclone. He did, throughout this run of Justice Society of America, he did um, individual characters on the cover, much like he would do with um, for Marvel with the Timeless variants. But in this, it was Justice Society characters and Cyclone is on number three, prominently featured. So I think that that character does have some space to grow. She's going to be one of the younger characters in the Justice Society of America that we will see in the Black Adam film. And maybe she does have possibility to move beyond that, just that sole property. Moving, we're going to stay with Black Adam and go to another book on our list from 2006, and that's 52, number 12. And it's the first appearance of the new Isis, who does become the wife of Black Adam. Now, Isis was in a live-action Saturday morning television show in the 1970s, um, starring the late Joanna Cameron. And her premiere was in 1976 in Shazam number 25. She did have her own series in 1976. But Adriana Tomas, who becomes the wife of Black Adam, and that's going to be a character in the Black Adam film, premiered as Adriana Tomas in 52 number 3, and as Isis, and she's seen here on the cover in 52, number 12. So this is really a key um, character in the Black Adam mythos, and um, the Sarah Shahi has been confirmed as being cast. It's believed that she is being cast as Isis. Now, the only question I have is whether or not they will use that name, because obviously since the terrorist organization has used the name ISIS, it has become a little less popular. Um, so we will see. That book is a book that um, you can find for um, like a high-grade copy for $15. And I think there's the potential that this could take off, especially if she remains a character in future properties involving Black Adam. Now, there was a point in the comics where she was killed off and that sent Black Adam off on a violent rampage of vengeance. So we'll see if she stays around. Let's move into the 1990s and we're going to go to 1998 and Flash number 141, the first appearance of the Black Flash. In each of the three previous issues, he did have a cameo appearance. Those are raw books that can probably be found in the $60 to $70 range and there's a lot of speculation that Black Flash is going to be one of the villains in the upcoming Flash movie. Now, again, tread lightly when it comes to the Flash movie because we don't know exactly what's going to happen. I think Warner Brothers is going to have to make a decision of what to do with Ezra Miller. The problems that they've been encountering, the arrests, the restraining orders is not a good look for Warner Brothers in a big time character that they want to carry at least one feature film and potentially a feature film that's going to reset the timeline for the entire universe. So there's a lot of money from uh, from Warner Brothers invested in Ezra Miller and it's really going to be a gamble with the movie coming out in early 2023 of marketing Miller as the lead character in the movie. So Maybe we're going to have to look at some fallback options there. Let's go back a little bit. 1993, Static, number one. That is a character, Virgil Hawkins, who um, was in the Milestone 
comics in the 1990s. And then, after the comic was canceled, got his own Saturday morning cartoon, Static Shock, and it really reinvigorated the popularity and the interest in the character for a whole new audience who, watching the Saturday morning cartoons in the 2000s, were too young to have read the comic book in the 1990s. Now, issue number one did come in a poly bag, and poly bags notoriously have that poly bag crease that runs the length of a book. So if you do have a book, take it out of the poly bag, have it pressed before submitting it. Now, the two most recent 9.8 sales of that book were $250 and $375. Raws are in the $40 to $50 range. But this is a book sometimes you can find for a discount because it is not at all a rare book. A lot of them were printed. This character has been linked to the potential for a feature film with Michael B. Jordan's production company. We'll see what comes of that. I think this is a popular character because you have the comic book aspect and you also have those kids that grew up in the 2000s who are now adults who connected with the character. Uh, I think that Static is a character that has a lot of opportunity to grow. We did have seen him on Young Justice and also has the other milestone characters that he can bring along with him. Go back to the 1980s. We were talking about Ezra Miller's problems. Well, one of the ways that they could solve the problem, people have talked about recasting Grant Gustin as the Flash. You know, just have a quick time, um, you know, time slip, and all of a sudden you got a different guy as the Flash. That's a possibility, especially if he's stepping away from the show. But I think it also makes it kind of difficult to market to people who aren't completely familiar with The Flash, who think that they might have to watch eight seasons of the television show to get up to speed before going to a feature film. I think a more likely and a probably a more viable option is, just like DC Comics did in the 1980s when they killed off Barry Allen in Crisis on Infinite Earths, pass on the mantle to Wally West. And Flash number one from 1987 is the first appearance of Wally West as The Flash. He was previously Kid Flash. Going back to Flash Comics 110, which is a high price comic, a hard comic to find. It's from the early 60s. It's also the first appearance of Weather Wizard. That's hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Flash number one has sold recently for about $350 in a 9.8, but you can get raw copies a lot cheaper than that. It is, again, a book that was highly printed. So it is available. And it would make sense. Now, in the comics, Wally West was the niece of Iris West, who became Barry Allen's wife. Later on in the New 52, he was the brother, which is also what we saw play out on the Flash TV series. And with the New 52 and the TV series, Wally West is African-American as opposed to being redheaded as he was initially in the comics. So, um... There is the possibility that they could move in a diversity angle away from Ezra Miller, not have to recast the character, just pass on the mantle of the Flash to Wally West. I'm not sure if there has been a Wally West character cast for Flash. We haven't heard anything to that degree, but Iris West is in the movie. So it does leave the door open for that possibility, and this is a cheap buy that you can get in on now. Let's move back a year to 1986. And it seems as though one of the shows that will be coming to HBO Max, there's already been a cancellation just this week of the Wonder Twins movie, which was about to enter production, already had cast both Zan and Jaina. Right? Yeah, Zan and Jaina. As the Wonder Twins, that's been put on the ice. The Wonder Twins did seem like not like one of those properties that needed to be moved to the forefront. In terms of getting a series or a movie. But, and I think the people at Discovery have figured out the same thing. They put that on the back burner, canceled the plans for that movie. And this is something that people who follow DC have become familiar with that. Anna du DuVernay was supposed to do a New Gods movie. That was scrapped. All sorts of projects that have kind of been left by the wayside. So, um... I think we're going to get the Green Lantern Corps. They've cast Kyle Rayner. I believe they've cast Alan Scott. And one of the characters who we did see in the Ryan Reynolds film is Kilowog, whose first appearance is in Green Lantern Corps 201 in 1986, which is a book in a 9.8 sells in the $200 to $300 range. You can probably get a high-grade copy 
maybe in the forty to fifty dollar range if you find it in the right place. Um, Kilowog is one of the alien Green Lanterns, probably the. I would say, he's probably the most famous alien Green Lantern, and he kind of has that uh, a little bit of a, a comedic bent to him, which could be used as a um, kind of change of tone at times in the Green Lantern series. We'll see. Most of the other Green Lantern keys, the first appearance of Alan Scott, you cannot get. That is a book that is very, very scarce. All-American 16. Even Guy Gardner in Green Lantern 59 or John Stewart in Green Lantern 87. Kyle Rayner is a little more approachable. In Green Lantern, I guess it's volume three, number 49. And then, of course, you have Hal Jordan, who goes back to Showcase 22, which is a huge grail from the late 1950s, the early part of the Silver Age. So Green Lantern 201 is a pretty good hedge bet that's affordable for the upcoming Green Lantern series. And I would be shocked if we don't see that series come out. Let's go into the 1970s. And we're going to go uh, to um, Teen Titans number 48, which is the first appearance of Bumblebee. Now, Bumblebee is Karen Beecher, who made her first appearance a few issues earlier in Teen Titans 45. She was technically the first African-American female superhero that DC Comics produced, Nubia, who had premiered in Wonder Woman in 1973, was initially a villain, now she's a hero, and Vixen was supposed to premiere uh, prior to that, get her own title, but that was a victim of the DC implosion, and she did not premiere until, I think it was 1981 in Action Comics 521. Now, Bumblebee is a character that has been shown in some of the Teen Titans properties. She was briefly a member of Teen Titans Go. She also has been a major member of DC Superhero Girls, short cartoons that are seen on Cartoon Network. My daughters have always enjoyed them. And she has been one of the, I guess, the secondary characters. The main characters have always been kind of Wonder Woman, Batgirl, Harley Quinn, Supergirl. And then you have secondary characters like Poison Ivy and Katana and Bumblebee and Jessica Cruz. So they, um, she, she is a popular character, and I could see DC moving forward with using her. Now, initially in the comics, she was the girlfriend of Mal Duncan, who was a member of the Teen Titans and was the first African-American superhero, even though he wasn't super-powered, and he was just Mal Duncan for the longest time, to um, appear in DC Comics back in the 1960s. Also from the 1970s, this is a, a little bit of a weird one, but there's a reason for that. It's Shay the Changing Man number one, which was written and drawn by Steve Ditko. And the reason I have this on the list is because Shade was an inaugural member of Justice League Dark, which is a property that we've heard about for a long time. And we, I'm, we still hear rumors about it. So I do expect there's a very good possibility that Justice League Dark will happen. I've kind of been speculating on the, those characters. I'm going to talk about another one a little bit later on. You have Swamp Thing, you have Dead Man, Constantine, um, and one book that's almost impossible to find, which is the first appearance of Detective Chimp in Rex, The Adventures of Rex the Wonder Dog, number four, which I think is from 1951. Um, let's go back to the 1960s. Now, we did talk about the problems with Amber Heard. But there have been rumors that there's going to be an Aqua Baby. Um, basically the child of Arthur Curry, Aquaman, and Mira. And that's what we had in the comics. He was made his first appearance in Aquaman number 23. And I know a lot of people there are like, ah, baby first appearances. Aqua Baby never um, was able to um, grow out of being a baby. Because... In the 1970s in the Aquaman run, and this was really harsh for the time, Aqua Baby was killed by Black Manta. Now, and that caused, obviously, Aquaman a great deal of strife. It, it uh, for a while, destroyed his marriage, and they've never brought Aqua Baby back. The, if you remember the Aquaman movie, Black Manta wanted revenge against Aquaman because he blamed Aquaman for killing his father. Now, infanticide is really a dark subject to cover um, in a comic book or in a superhero movie. 
but that would make Black Manta really evil if he killed a baby. And it would probably be kind of by accident, but in an aggressive move towards Atlantis or towards Aquaman. Um, and that we could see. Now, the problem is they could recast another actress as Mira or, and this is kind of a spec that's not on my list, but we could talk about it. They could um, recast for a while. Aquaman had his love interest and then uh, a character who later also had a relationship with um, Aqualad is Dolphin, whose first appearance in um, showcase number 79 is sought after for its classic cover. She made that one appearance, didn't appear again for several years until Showcase 100, and then later on became a regular member of the Aquaman Atlantean mythos. And it's possible they could move in that direction. They could do something with Mira and then Aquaman, you know, have the, the marriage break up because of the death of the baby, have him move on to some other um, romantic interest. The other, the final book on the list from the 1960s is Adam number 19, which is the second appearance and the first cover appearance of Zatanna. Also a member of the Justice League Dark. Her first appearance in Hawkman number four is a book that just keeps increasing in value. That's a very expensive book. The Adam book, you'll probably get very fine copies for under $100. She appeared in three comics. She also later appeared in Green Lantern. And then in Justice League, I think it was 55, where they kind of wrapped up the story. Zatanna has a lot of keys, um, and all of them are kind of worth keeping out an eye for. I think it's Flash 193, or for a solo story. Uh, DC Superstars of Magic, which has her on the cover and reprints a bunch of her stories, is a very sought-after book, uh, a book that in higher grade is worth getting graded. But this, Adam 19, is a book that a lot of people don't pay attention to. And so that is something that we could uh, see. I, because I do think Zatanna does have a future in either DC television or television or movie properties. Um, so that's my top 10. Let me know what you think. Um, it seems as though the news about DC changes every day. Um, in the comments below, let me know what you think of these spec books. If you have any other books that you think are interesting that you're collecting, I do have some that I'm also collecting, um, getting, uh, I'm, but they, they're more expensive than some of the books on the list. You know, I'm looking at Strange Adventures 205, First uh, Dead Man, Strange Adventures 180, First Animal Man. I've been collecting Infinite Crisis 3 and 5 for the first appearance of Jaime Reyes Blue Beetle because we know that he's coming. Um, they haven't canceled that yet, and it's supposed to be a theatrical release. And then a lot of the other first appearances from DC are astronomically expensive. Even the first Batgirl and then going back to the Golden Age. So take a look at a couple of other videos that we got going on here. Um, and again, leave in the comments what you think of these things. And this is Jim. By the way, oh, I, I should mention this. Um, tomorrow night. Wednesday night, 10 o'clock, right here. I'll be with Joe from 360 Comics, and we will be talking about the finale of Moon Knight. Come and join us for that. There are going to be giveaways. I'm going to have some Moon Knight books, and there are going to be trivia questions to win those giveaways. That's going to be a lot of fun. So come on in um, and participate in that. And then the very next day, Multiverse of Madness. It's a crazy week. It's a Marvel week, and I'm doing a DC video. Anyway, this is Jim saying until next time, enjoy your comics.